numbers are small. What's happening here, though, is your K-2s, your 13,000 kids here, their families never had to tell us that they were starting their child in a private school or homeschool environment, so they've never been with the system. If they started with us and then they withdrew, then we have that documentation, we have exit codes. But no one needs to tell public schools in the state of Washington for five-year-olds, six-year-olds, or seven-year-olds that they're not attending school. So you look at the national data and you say, wow, Washington's missing a lot of children. No, we have an eight-year-old compulsory ed law. And it's really bad for data collection. And it sends a lot of mis uh, notions out there about what's happening. That's the first thing I wanted to show you is those kind of two orange boxes. I put little boxes around them and show you the map. The yellow here, I just wanted you to see the interesting idea of the enrollment forecast. 2021 was our, was our you know, almost fully remote year. We brought students back in that spring, but it was almost a fully remote year. You saw K drop off by 12,000 enrollments, but look at that forecast through time as they age through the system. Essentially, the forecast council says you're going to get it back. And that's not unusual. Homeschool through usually age 11 or age 12, and often time to return. What I want to point out, though, is the forecast never gets better for us. We are looking at 8 to 10 years of the lower numbers that we're seeing today because what's not evident here is declining birth rates. It's hitting the whole country. We've got about three or four more years of these really high graduation volumes because those classes are, tend to be uh, high, pretty high, high volume. We're going to keep producing the same volume of students at the almost record high grad rates for higher ed institutions. But after about four or five years from now, you are going to start seeing smaller groups of students enter the school system. And by then, even the high schools will have smaller numbers, um, such that you're going to see fewer young people. <laughs> it's just the demographic. It's just the declining birth rates. If I took you to that last column and I added up K through 5, you would see 100,000 fewer students than in grades 6 through 12. 100,000 fewer students in the first half of our grade cycle than our second half, and they will age through the system. So there's your headlines I've already written. I won't see you again for years now because we're all done here. But this, this budget issue will persist. Now, I want to tell you the other factors. That, that, so that's long term. But the other factors today that are impacting schools and the reason you're hearing about school mergers and school closures and all of that is we have a watch of probably 20 or 30 districts. And we haven't quantified this. So you're going to I'll ask me, what are the schools? We haven't quite built the full matrix of this yet. But I want to give you the variables that we're starting to dive into. Did your district have a two-time or three-time levy failure? And fortunately, our biggest risk was Marysville. Congratulations to them. They passed the levy. It looks like it will. Centralia is on our watch list now. They're very, very at risk at this point. You combine that with federal dollars going away. We've told districts multiple times in every communication, do not rely on these federal dollars for permanent compensation increases. And I think they've done a good job. They really have not. But the federal dollars did allow them to fill holes. So when they couldn't find bus drivers, they brought in bus drivers. When they couldn't get food and nutrition, they brought them in. When they needed tutoring, summer jumpstart, they hired something like 7,000 more people. Those are all going away in the next two years. That money will phase out. It's ahead of schedule. It will go away. So if you're at levy risk, now your federal dollar is going away. Maybe your district has been impacted by enrollment decline, so the state is pulling its portion of dollars away. Put a fourth variable on that, which is... Um, this legislature, four years ago when they passed the McCleary fix and air quotes, already designed it so that 30 districts in the state would have money pulled away every year. They gave them this big money for compensation. You all covered it brilliantly in, your, in the news cycle. You know the labor strife that was there, but then immediately the legislature put a four-year plan together and said, we're going to start pulling 1% to 2% of those dollars away from districts over time, the regionalization factor. And they said, inflation will grow you into that. But you've already got districts who have been getting less and less state dollars as a result of it. Now, with the last one, levies. If you recall, we used to have a levy system that was at least understandable. If you looked at your budget, all resources in a district, you got to hit it by some percentage, that's what you can go to the voters. Now you have to take the lesser of two things. Basically $2,500 per child in your district, or up to $2.50 per thousand assessed valuation. Whichever one generates less money, that's the one you have to go with. It seemed absolutely brilliant four years ago. And all of a sudden, home values started doing this. <laughs> and in some places, enrollment started going this direction. So two exact districts are going to be in a very different place in the year or two when they go back out to their voters. One gets to collect more money because valuations are up. And the other one has to collect less money because some of their enrollments haven't recovered. So we're putting this together. We're going to try to share this as much as we can over the next three to six months as we build models around these risk categories. We've got, like I said, two to three dozen districts that we already are concerned about. We have this binding conditions process where they go through an effort of showing their um, financial resolve, the work with their education. <coughs>
Education Service District, and if necessary, unless PI gets involved in helping them. That's the bad news story. <laughs> the bad news story is this pandemic didn't just create a blip and we're all going to bounce back. There's, there's underlying factors. The good news story is we came to this town this year and said, hey, this is a reality. We're not asking for money to make up for enrollments. Districts have to manage to this reality going forward. But what you know what hasn't always been funded? Special education services, 500 million or more. Student transportation movements. We've got a mental health crisis that is unprecedented in this country. Ask the average young people what they worry about. They worry about getting killed in their own school by gun violence, and they worry about the environment. And whether you like those issues or not, those are real for young people. It's damn real to them. And they want counselors and nurses and school psychs. And they don't want to have to wait six months on a referral. So we came to this town this year, and we asked the House and the Senate, Yes, we're going to shrink in terms of our overall scope and size in K-12. That's understandable. We'll manage to it. But you've always had a problem funding these core services, so get after it. And right now, I'm not very optimistic. They're going to throw a few bucks at these things, but it's as if the K-12 bucket is done. That's the troubling part right now. So we're going to keep pounding the table. We're going to keep trying to shore up the system so that the 1.06 million kids we still have, instead of 1.1 million, still get great services. But that's the challenge right now is the perception that we're done with the pandemic and that schools are amply funded and us saying, no, actually, they're not. The last thing I'll say is some of you don't like it when I use these data, but uh, we are a state that's putting 3.1% of our GDP back in the public ed. The national average is 3.6%. That half a percent is more than $2 billion a year. This budget would put $4 billion more in the next biennial cycle just to get K-12 to the national average investment level. And there's no formula for that. There's no mandate. I'm not suggesting the legislature will do that or necessarily should, but it's a metric to think about. Despite all the investments we've made, we still don't invest like the average state, and I think that's a little bit troubling. And finally, right after McCleary, we were 51% of the biennial budget. Next biennium, we dropped to 48%, the K-12 share of the near general revenues. And this budget looks like we're going to be 44%. We're going to be right back to where we were pre McCleary as a share of the state budget. And I'll be coming back over and over again to tell this story. You have questions, I have answers. If they're really hard, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to answer that. Yeah. 